actually make immune responses to antigen. And we want to start with sort of this clonal selection theory, right, where we've covered B cell development. And as the B cells are maturing in the bone marrow, they finally exit as mature B cells. And that is called the naive repertoire. It's sort of all of the potential B cells in your, in your lymphatics and your, and your blood that could potentially re react to antigen. And only one in about a million or maybe less than that is specific for any epitope. And so remember, all of these B cells have a different B cell receptor and only the ones that recognize antigen are going to respond. Okay, so this is your naive repertoire. Naive in this sense really means it's never been kissed by antigen. Um, sort of tongue in cheek way of describing it, but it's, it's pretty accurate that naive B cells have just never been, have never recognized their antigen. And so they're continually circulating from the blood to the lymph nodes where they look for antigen. And eventually they drain upstream to the thoracic duct and re-enter the blood. But they spend most of their time, 90% of their time or, or greater, in the lymph nodes looking for antigen. They actually spend very little time in the blood. <clears throat> so B cell activation occurs when these naive B cells encounter the antigen in the lymph nodes. And part about what we'll talk about today is how does that happen? How do all of the things get to the right place? And then we'll briefly touch on what do T cells do in this scenario? And without T cell help, that limits the B cell response, both in terms of the magnitude and duration, the affinity, the types of, of uh, isotypes that are generated. And so without T cell help, you sort of have an abortive B cell response. So here's what's typically put into textbooks. And this is actually from a Nature Reviews uh, paper on immunology of how a B cell gets activated. And this is the dogma, right? That B cells are recognizing antigen sorry, here, they internalize it and they get activated. They then degrade it, as we talked about for MHC2, they're degrading this in the uh, endolysosomes that fuse with the M2C. And then they present the antigen on their surface for T cells to become activated. The problem is that this doesn't actually ever occur, this, this one step process. All of the steps do occur, but they don't occur in one step like this. Okay, so they're separated both temporally and spatially so that one thing, the first thing that happens is B cells get activated and then they go look for T cell help. And so these are separated. But this is an easy way to show that there's linked recognition of B cells and T cells, right? So that B cells are recognizing the structural part of it, the antigen, and then the T cells are recognized something that is in, the B cell is internalizing and processing and putting on the MHC2. But this is not how the B cell gets started. So the questions that we're gonna cover today are how did the antigen get to the lymph node, right? For a B cell response to happen, there has to be some antigen that the B cells recognize. And for that to happen, the antigen has to go from the site of infection to the lymph node. The second question is how did uh, the antigen get to the B cell parts of the lymph node? Remember the, the lymph node is separated into B cell zones and T cell zones. So the antigen has to get to the right part. And then how did the B cell get to, into the lymph node and how did it go about looking for its antigen? And then once that happens, once the B cell finds its, its cognate antigen, cognate just means the one that it's specific for, how did the B cells get activated so that they know to go find the T cell and present the processed antigen on MHC2 so that the T cell can provide the full activation signals? Okay, so those are the questions that we're gonna cover. So it's good to come back to this sort of general scheme of how the system operates. And the first question is where, how does the antigen enter the lymph node? Is it through the afferent lymphatics or through the high endothelial venules? Well, the an answer is the antigens coming through the afferent lymphatics, right? It's coming from the peripheral drains, the antigen 
uh, is going into the, to the uh, lymphatic capillaries and it's being brought to the lymph node. The B cells are not entering the lymph node that way. The B cells are coming through the high endothelial venules. So they're, they're going across each other. Okay, so this maximizes the chance that the B cells and antigen will meet up in the lymph node. So the first question is, how does the antigen get to the lymph node? And the first thing that we have to differentiate is between very small antigens. Anything smaller than a bacteria can passively diffuse to the lymph node, meaning it's, it's taken in the lymph that's collecting in the lymphatic capillaries, it's draining to the lymph node, and so that's a diffusion or, or passive transport. And this can be true for, for free antigen, antigen that's bound by antibodies or antigen that has complement proteins stuck to it. So basically you have to keep in mind the size. Anything smaller than a bacteria can passively diffuse to the lymph node. Perhaps more importantly is large structures like immune complexes or microbes that get opsonized by complement proteins and or antibodies are transported to lymph nodes by macrophages. And remember, it's sort of this active transport where macrophages are, exp are expressing complement receptor 2, which if you remember is displacing BB from the complement pathway, inactivating C through B to IC through B. And that then tells that macrophage, hold it on your surface and just take it to the lymph node. This is some dead thing that we need to make a response to. In terms of, of importance, People can make responses to small soluble antigens, but it's more important that you have this active transport. And people who have deficiencies in antigen transport, like deficiencies in CR2 or in certain FC receptors, if it's antibody opsonized, have troubles transporting antigen to the lymph node, and so they don't make proper antibody responses. Okay, so Keep in mind whenever we talk about antigen, it's the size that matters. Viruses and free proteins are very small. They diffuse passively. Anything bigger than a bacteria has to be brought there on a macrophage. So if we remember, how does a lymph node look? What is the structure? Okay, so the antigen is coming in through the, through the afferent lymphatics, okay? It's, these are the tubes that, that are bringing antigen in. They're draining sites of infection. And so whether it is a macrophage or carrying antigen or antigen freely diffusing, it comes in through the lymphatics. Now, when it comes in to the lymphatics, the, the lymph node is separated into three main areas. There's the cortex, which is the B cell zone, the paracortex, which is the T cell zone, and the medullary region, which is the medulla and medullary science, science, sinus, that essentially is the drain, okay? Everything that didn't respond is gonna go out the medullary sinus and to the efferent lymphatics, okay? So antigen's coming in here and eventually makes its way out to, out to the efferent lymphatics. Okay, so once the antigen gets into the lymph node, so this is so how the antigen got to the lymph node, it's either passive diffusion or active transport by macrophages. But whatever way that it gets to the lymph node, the second step is to get to the B cell zones or the, or the cortical regions. And it's either, if it's free antigen, it's passively diffusing there, it's going to go inside what are called the follicular reticular network, or the FRN. The FRN is a series of hollow tubes that permeate the entire lymph node. And you can think of these as sort of the plumbing of the lymph node. And the important part about the follicular reticular network is that antigen is going to come in through the inside of those, and it's going to, they're very leaky pipes. And so the antigen leaks out of the pipes as it comes in, and that allows it to to be into the B cell zone. If it has uh, antigen is bound to IC3B, then follicular dendritic cells, which are the main activating cells for B cells, will pick that up and display it on their surface, okay? And so if it's just free antigen, 
just going to diffuse there and be picked up by follicular dendritic cells. But as I said, the more important mechanism is active transport, where macrophages are going to bring the antigen in either because of uh, uh, expressing CR2 and recognizing complement proteins, IC3B, or if it's antibody coded, they're going to have FC receptors on the surface that will help them carry it to the, to the lymph node. Once they get to the lymph node, they're going to transfer the antigen to what are called subcapsular space macrophages. And the subcapsular space is this area right on top of the cortex. Okay? And that's where these macrophages sit, and their job is to control what gets passed into the cortex. Now this is probably a distinct lineage of specialized macrophages, but nobody's been able to tell whether this is, this is a distinct lineage or whether antigen-bearing macrophages that have carried antigen into the lymph node when they get there, differentiate into subcapsular space macrophages. Now, once they do that, the subcapsular space macrophages are going to control the flow of antigen. And eventually, they're going to pass this off to follicular dendritic cells. So the key is to get the antigen on follicular dendritic cells in the cortex so that you can activate uh, B cells. So the way that it sort of looks here is, is if you just have small antigen, free antigen, or viruses, it's going to come in through the afferent lymphatics, and it's going to go mainly through the follicular reticular network, and once it leaks out, these are the FDCs, okay? Oh, my handwriting's not very good with this pen. Those are the follicular dendritic cells, and those are going to pick up that antigen and display it on their surface. Okay, now the subcapsular space macrophages play a very minor role in this because the antigen is coming mainly through these conduit. But if it's got, if it's got um, IC3B on it, it can actually be picked up by those subcapsular space macrophages and transferred on. But the main way is through the, through the follicular reticular network. However, if it's something big, right, if it's large uh, antibody antigen complement or antibody antigen complexes, those are going to be brought into the, to the subcapsular space by macrophages having carried it there. Okay, and that's the more important mechanism is even for viruses and, and smaller things, macrophages are still going to carry it. So the subcapsular space macrophages are going to pick that antigen up by, because they have more CR2 and they transfer it for two follicular dendritic cells. But in this case, there's an intermediate. There is a tissue resident B cell. It's not antigen specific, but it acts sort of as like the mail carrier, right? Where it's going to take the antigen from the subcapsular space macrophages and transfer it to the follicular dendritic cells. So it's sort of a two-step process. The antigen gets picked up by sub subcapsular space macrophages. They transfer it to these non-antigen specific B cells, that then transfer it to follicular dendritic cells. And this is a little bit blown up picture, right, of what, what is happening here. So these subcapsular space macrophages that are sitting just on top of the cortex are going to bind to either to complement proteins or an, in this case, it's binding via the FC receptor on the antibody. And they're going to transfer it by transcyto transcytosis from the subcapsular sinus, right, the, area just on top of the cortex, into the cortex where the B cells can take it. And so these non-antigen specific follicular B cells are going to bind it, but they're not binding it because they're recognizing antigen, they're recognizing either complement proteins or antibodies, and they're transferring it to the follicular dendritic cells, okay, which are down here. Then at each step <clears throat> in the pathway, the, the subsequent cell expresses higher levels of the complement receptor or higher affinity versions of those complement receptors. And so there, it's not like it's passing it off, it's more like it's being stolen at each step by the, this next cell. So 
subcapsular space macrophages will steal it from macrophages that brought it in. The B cells, the follicular B cells, are going to steal the antigen from the subcapsular space macrophages, and eventually they run into the follicular dendritic cells, which then finally steal the antigen. And this is the sort of last place where antigen ends up is on the follicular dendritic cells. So these follicular dendritic cells, I often describe them as the Christmas tree. They're going to hold these ornaments or, or antigen complexes on their surface for many, many days, weeks, up to months, okay? And they express all of the complement receptors, and especially they have complement receptor three. Remember, CR2 is the one that's most important for, for antigen transport to a lymph node. CR1 is more important for internalization and, and uh, phagocytosis, but CR3 is the one where it is the highest avidity uh, uh, complement receptor, and so it will display this on its surface for a long periods of time. These FDC also have many types of FC receptors, so if the antigen comes in coated with, with antibody, then it can also hold it on its surface. And that's what's shown here where you have lots of these FC receptors that are holding antibodies that are bound to an antigen. Okay, so it's really FC receptors and complement receptors are the things on the follicular dendritic cell that are gonna hold it on its surface. And this can be for quite a long time. Some studies have indicated that antigen can persist on the FDCs for up to uh, months. I think most people would say many weeks, but, but up to potentially a couple months. And that, that's because they have roles in initial B cell activation, but also in shaping the immune response. And we'll talk about that during, uh, later in this lecture about how they're actually providing antigen during maturation of the B cell response. And that's, that's in terms of affinity maturation and testing whether B cells are a good fit. Okay, so we've covered how antigen gets to a lymph node, either by passive diffusion or active transport, and then how antigen is passed onto the follicular dendritic cells. Now the next step is now the B cell has to come along and interact with that follicular dendritic cell and try and see if it recognizes that antigen. But remember, the B cells are coming into the lymph node via the high endothelial venules. And this is, the HEV are sort of at the, they're in the paracortex. And so B cells, when they come into a lymph node, initially are in the T cell zone and have to migrate to the cortex, which is the B cell zone. And <clears throat> there's a series of, of uh, chemokine receptors, uh, CCR5, which uh, CRA6, CXCR5, which is important for B cells to do this, but we don't cover all of those migration signals in this course, just because it's more important to know that they're moving towards the cortex rather than all of the molecular signals that get you there. Okay, so I really just want you to know they migrate towards the, towards the cortex. Once the B cell gets to the cortex, that's where those follicular dendritic cells are. And if it finds its antigen, on that follicular dendritic cell, that's the first step in B cell activation. Okay, that's where the B cell initially gets activated. Says, yes, okay, I'm, I'm antigen specific and then I should go and do other things. But most of the time, remember, only one in a million B cells is specific for any antigen. And so the B cells don't see their antigen. They're going to exit the lymph node via the medullary sinus, which drains to the efferent lymphatics and eventually they'll go upstream. So if there's no antigen recognition, it goes this way, eventually up into the thoracic duct or right lymphatic duct, and back into the blood, okay? So it goes back into circulation. And this take, typically takes about, for B cells, it's about 36 hours. I know in the, the notes that I sent out, it says 24. It's probably closer to 36. Um, for T cells, it's, it's usually about 24 because B cells have this extra step. It takes them a little bit longer to go to the cortex and then they have to migrate all the way back to the medullary regions. But in any case, this is, each B cell spends about a day to a day and a half looking for antigen in a lymph node. 
So we used to think when I first first taught immunology was sort of the B cells just go on a random walk within the lymph node and hopefully they'll run into an FDC. We now know that that's not the case at all. There are chemokine signals by FDCs that are attracting B cells. So the B cells are moving towards that chemokine and they're also traveling on top of the follicular reticular network. Okay, so a, a random walk is just too inefficient for the B cells to run into a follicular dendritic cell. So your immune system doesn't rely on chance, it relies on directed signals. Okay, so the B cells and the follicular dendritic cells that are have, holding their antigen are moving on the outside of those leaky pipes, right? The follicular reticular network is these series of pipes that leaking antigen. Okay, so the antigen's coming on the inside and the B cells and follicular dendritic cells are moving on the outside. And so they're bound to smack into each other. You can think of this as two cars or two trains on the same train track going towards each other. Eventually they hit each other and, and are looking for, am I a good fit for that antigen on there? So the follicular reticular network, which we sort of brush over a lot, really is important for two things. And the first is small soluble antigens are coming into the, the B cell area uh, on the inside of the tubes, and then it leaks out. And it can be captured by follicular dendritic cells, can also be captured by conventional dendritic cells when we talk about T cell activation in a few lectures. Um, but the antigen is being brought in on the inside and then the follicular dendritic cells and the antigen specific B cells are traveling on the outside. Okay, so this makes it easy for antigen, uh, FDCs and B cells to all be in the right place. And that's sort of a, it's easier to picture this as a tube, right? Is that there, these follicular reticular network cells or tubes are endothelial cells. And on the outside of them, they have this heavy collagen coating. So your hematopoietic cells like to travel on collagen. And this, this tube then is, is bringing cells together on the outside and it's bringing antigen in through the inside, okay? And so the B cells and FTCs move on the outside here of these leaky tubes and the antigens are coming in through the inside and they can leak out, okay? If it's something very small, a small antigen like proteins or small viruses. <clears throat> and remember, if it's, if it's something larger than a virus, the follicular dendritic cells get loaded a different way, right? They're loaded by subcapsular space macrophages transferring antigen to the follicular B cells that then transfer it to FDC. Okay, so are there any questions on that before we keep going? And there's a, we're sort of compartmentalizing and trying to show how everything gets in the right place. So these are only for the ones that are undergoing passive diffusion. Right. For, for active transport, it's this other mechanism that FDCs are getting loaded by the follicular B cells, non-antigen specific follicular B cells. But in any case, the FDCs are still traveling on the outside of the follicular reticular network. However, they got antigen. I just kind of had a broad question about lymph nodes. Um, are they all the same size? And if they are, um, do the B cell, or if they aren't, um, if, do the B cells stick around in a larger or smaller um, lymph node? Like, is this 36 hours just kind of a, 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 a general statement for all lymph nodes? Or does it depend on the lymph node if they're different sizes? There, there are different sizes of lymph nodes. And so it's just a general statement of about how long for a typical lymph node. For example, your inguinal lymph nodes, which are at your hip, on the inside of your hip, are fairly large. Whereas some of the ones, you have this whole network of them underneath your chin on the upper part of your neck. Um, the subcervical lymph nodes are much smaller, but there's many more of them. Okay, so it's just a general statement. Um, however, during inflammation, the lymph nodes get bigger because they swell up with cells, right? So you remember you feel sick, you didn't want to go to school and your parent would palpate your lymph nodes to see if they're swollen. If they are, that indicates you're making an immune response and that's why you feel sick. 
And so those, those lymph nodes get bigger, and as they get bigger, it takes more time. They're also recruiting cells and, and expressing chemokines that retain cells longer in there, so there's a better chance of a B cell trying to find antigen. So it does change. I have a question. Just to clarify, uh, in the lymph node, macrophages don't directly present antigens to the FDCs. It's done through the B cells? Correct. And they're, okay. I would stay away from using the term present because they're actually transporting it. They're not really presenting it, which we sort of reserve for antigen presentation to B cells and T cells. Now, I know that seems like I'm splitting hairs there, but, but let's just call that transport. And so they're not directly transporting it to the FDCs. It has to go through these um, non-antigen specific follicular B cells. Okay. Um, okay, so let's keep going. All right, so we've got the B cell and the follicular denturiac cell that's presenting the antigen. They're on the outside of the follicular reticular network and they're gonna run into each other. And how does B cell know whether or not it gets activated? Remember, the B cell receptor, just that surface version of the antibody, doesn't have a signaling protein. It has to show, associate with the signaling proteins, Ig alpha and Ig beta, which are here. Okay, and those have the intracellular tyrosine activation motifs. Now, the other proteins that are part of the B cell receptor complex, right, sometimes we refer to the BCR as not just the receptor, but also all of these other associated proteins. It's the CD21 and CD19. Any idea what that is? It's a protein that we talked 21, about. Oh, sorry. Keep going. Oh, I was going to say, isn't CD21 like the growth factor? Well, it can be in other contexts. But in this, this is CR2, right? So it makes a lot of sense that if you're going to recognize antigen, you've spent all of this energy coding something with complement proteins and it's getting transported by those. Then if that's the case, then it makes a lot of sense for the co-receptor for B cells to be the complement receptor protein. So here you're going to recognize antigen. And here you're going to recognize IC through B. Okay, so this is why we spend an entire lecture on complement because it turns out to be really important, not just for forming the membrane sac complex and coding things, but also for transporting stuff to the lymph node and for B cell activation. And so any defect in complement results in either uh, inability to generate good antibody responses or you don't get antigen to a lymph node. And ultimately this can result in, in other things like autoimmunity, which we're, we're not gonna go into this class, but, but that's one of the consequences. So when you have this, this receptor, what you're looking for is cross-linking of the B cell receptor. And we'll talk about this more when we go into T cell activation. But what we don't show here is there's lots of these proteins on the cell surface that have phosphatases. Phosphatases prevent signaling. If you cross-link the B cell receptors and bring them all in the same place, then kinases, which I'll just put here, are going to be able to recognize this without the interference of, of the phosphatases. And we'll go through that in just a second. <clears throat> and so we, when we talk about B cell responses, if that's all that occurs, right, without any T cell help, this would give you a thymus independent response. So something like a protein that, that has, um, you know, is coated with complement proteins, it's brought in, you, you do this and there's no T cell activation, this is all you would get. But for a full B cell response, remember when we talked about that initial slide of B cells then internalize it and process the antigen and then present it on MHC2 to T cells, 
So that, that's what's required for a full B cell response. And we'll talk about the, the, what that results in, in in just a bit. That's the thymus dependent part of activation. So it's this next step of internalization and processing and presenting the antigen on MHC2 to T cells, that gives you T cell help and that will change the response. So if we're just talking about cross-linking, well, why does that happen? Well, it could be if this is a large thing like a bacteria, right, then it's got many copies of that same antigen on its surface and it's also coated with ICD3B. And so there's lots of opportunities just to bring them all together. And for, to put this in perspective, if you look at a size of a bacteria versus the size of a cell, bacteria is about one one hundredth the size of a cell, right? So it's very small. And so it's actually focusing everything in the, in the same area. But it could also be if you just have proteins that are bound to, to follicular dendritic cell, then you have multiple complexes on the same FDC. And so that's going to cross-link the, the uh, B cell receptors on those B cells. Okay, so it can either be just inherent to the, to the microbe where there's lots of the same structure or lots of other of the same structure being brought together on the FDC. In either case, this is what you need for initial B cell activation. So we don't go a lot into signaling pathways, but I think it is important to sort of review the kinase cascades that lead down ultimately to transcription factor activation. And so I've, there's a lot of things that are left out here, but I'm just giving you an overview so that you have some sense of how this works. Now, there's a few things I wanna make clear. This is incorrect, right? They're not associating with the cytoplasmic tails of the B cell receptor. These are associating actually with the Ig alpha and beta that are associated with it because these have the items on them. Okay, so the drawing's a little bit incorrect. Okay, so the first thing that happens is you have cross-linking of the B cell receptor. And this results in the recruitment and activation of kinases. In this case, there are two, Fin and Lin, right? So here's Fin and Lin, and these are going to phosphorylate the Ig alpha and beta ITAMs, or intracellular tyrosine activation motifs. So they're just putting phosphate groups on those tyrosines in the ITAMs. And then this acts as a landing pad for other kinases. And so this is sort of a, a, an amplification signal. Whenever you have kinases, they're going to phosphorylate multiple things, and then that's going to recruit other things that phosphorylate more things. And so Finn and Lin do the initial phosphorylation. Then another kinase called SYK or SYK binds to those ITAMs and becomes phosphorylated itself, and that activates it. And so now it's going to, now you have amplification. And SYK will phosphorylate blink or this is a B cell specific kinase, that then once it's phosphorylated, recruits Bruton's tyrosine kinase. So here's Blink and here's BTK. That is the, those are the main steps, right, of the kinase amplification. Now there are other things that happen. There's calcium release, there's, um, there's uh, protein kinase C activation. There's also a kinase cascade. But this ultimately results in activation of phospholipase C gamma, okay? And it's shown here as associated with the membrane because it's what it's doing is taking phosphoinositol diphosphate and cleaving that into two secondary messengers, okay? So phospho phospholipase C is going to cleave those fatty acids on the inner leaflet of the, pl of the plasma membrane into diacylglycerol and inositol triphosphate, so DAG and IP3. Diacylglycerol activates the protein kinase C cascade. There's lots of intermediates here, but that always gives you activation of NF-kappa B, right? If you remember from your cell biology courses, the three main ways is you, that you're going to get activation of these is through um, phosphorylation and inactivation of the inhibitor of NF-kappa B,
That then releases NF kappa bay to get in. The other thing that's going to happen is that you have a MAP kinase cascade that phosphorylates AP1 elements that come together. Those then are transcription factors. And then calcium release is going to ultimately activate NFAT, or nuclear factor of activation in T cells. NF kappa B was discovered in B cells, NF NFAT was discovered in T cells, but they operate in both lymphocytes. Okay, so do you need to know all these minor steps? No, you just need to know the five steps that I have on the left, okay? There's fin and lin, that activates SIC. SIC activates blink and BTK. BTK activates phospholipase C. And phospholipase C ultimately is the thing that, that results in transcription factor activation. So we said that the co-receptor for the B cells is complement receptor 2, it's CD19 and 21. Um, in mice, it also has this TAPA1 protein or CD81 that's associated with it. This is the co-receptor. And we'll see this again when we come to T cells, but the co-receptor's job is to reinforce this activation cascade, okay? And so CR2, the co-receptor on B cells, is going to bind IC3B. And essentially what it's doing is, is if you think about it, you've coded something with complement and it overcame all of your, excuse me, all of those inhibitory or regulatory mechanisms. So your immune system doesn't have to worry about so much about making a response. And so if, you, if you're recognizing antigen and you're recognizing complement, it lowers the threshold for B cell activation. And so here we see Fin and Lin, here's, that activates the ITAMs. SICK binds to it, that starts the pathway we just talked about, of Blink and BTK and phospholipase C gamma. But it's also going to um, make the complement receptor amenable to activation. And this then, when SICK activates the CR2, if CR2 is bound to antigen, then you have another protein which is called uh, PI3 kinase. And this is an important protein in reinforcing the B cell receptor signal. Okay, so you cross link the B cell receptor and, and activate transcription factors, but this other complementary uh, signaling pathway results in activation of PI3 kinase or phosphoinositide 3 kinase. And this will do something to those um, other lipids on the internal leaflet of the plasma membrane. This will generate phospholinositol, phosphatidylinositol triphosphate, PIP3. And this is a separate signaling pathway, okay? It, it results in further activation of these initial kinases, particularly FIN and LIN. And that sort of makes the, the B cell re signaling response stronger because these are already pre-activated. B cell knows that, okay, it's got complement on it. I should probably make a response. So sort of lowering the bar. Okay, so that's all initial B cell activation. You can kind of think of it, what if we didn't have a complement? Well, you would just have the B cell receptor signal and that could activate a B cell, but if you have the complement receptor and the B cell receptor, it makes it easier for the B cell to get activated. Well, the next step is the B cell has to go find a T cell. Dr. So, Latin. Yes. Quick question. So you said that SICK needs to activate CR2 first before it can go and activate PI3. Yeah, well, I say that, but it's, that's how it's drawn in textbooks. In reality, we don't really know how it's activating PI3 kinase. That continues to be uh, a source of debate. But so, you have to have some phosphorylation of CD19. And, and so you can kind of think of it the way that the complement receptor 2 and the B cell receptor 2 are sort of migrating independently on the surface of the B cell receptor. If they're brought together and 6 being activated, then it can phosphorylate, phosphorylate CR2. That's how it knows that antigen and, and IC3B are in the same place because it's bringing them together. Does that make sense? Well, can it be activated without? No, it needs okay. a kinase and we think that it's CR2. Okay. 
but okay. you're discovering new kinases all the time. But it, so it, the way to think about that is if CR2 is just floating around in the plasma membrane and it's not next to the B cell receptor, then it doesn't get activated on its own. But if it's brought together because you have antigen and IC3B together, and here, this is older terminology, IC3B is sometimes called C3D, but, but I think it's easier to keep it consistent as IC3B. Then the, the B cell receptor and the complement receptor are brought together. And so the initial B cell activation then results in phosphorylation of the complement receptor. Then you have PI3 kinase come in and you get this other activation pathway. Okay, thank you. Do we know how all these surface receptors are being brought together? Well, you get into the idea there of lipid rafts. And so the idea is that they're sort of preformed units that are brought together when there's things are happening. Um, we do know that the B cell receptor and complement receptors are in lipid rafts, which are sort of, they're less fluid um, lipids so they're, you know, they're more straight chain lipid fatty acids that are making up that thing. And they're sort of floating in a sea of the uh, more branched or, or uh, more, uh, fatty, chain, fatty acids that have more double bonds. And so they're bent. Right? So that they have more fluidity, sort of like uh, rafts floating in the ocean. And so they're preformed and they're brought together. But that's still an active area of research. Okay, so the B cell has gotten a B cell receptor signal and it's got a complement receptor two signal. That provides this initial B cell activation, but now you need CD4 help, okay? And so what's happening is these B cells are actually stealing the antigen from the FDCs. They're internalizing it and they're processing it. It goes into the MHC2 classical pathway of fusing with lysosomes and then phagolysosomes and then that ends up um, meeting up with the M2C, where it's loaded onto class two and presented on the surface of the B cell. This initial activation signal for the B cell tells it, go look for a T cell. Okay, so remember where we are, we're in the cortex, and now we have to go towards the T cell zones, which are the paracortex. And there are cytokine signals, or, or sorry, chemokine signals that are directing this. Again, I'm not expecting you to know all of those, just know that it tells that B cell, okay, you've been activated, now go find a T cell in the paracortex. As it's doing that, it internalizes the antigen, degrades it in the classical MHC2 pathway, and is presenting it on surface on, on MHC2. And so the B cells are on the way to the T cell zones, and we'll talk later in two or three lectures about T cells got activated in the T cell zones and they're headed towards the B cells. And so they meet up, sort of this is Romeo and Juliet story, at the cortical paracortical junction, okay? So they're meeting on the border, and that's where the B cells get a chance to present their antigen to T cells. And if the T cells recognize it, great, then full activation occurs. And so that's sort of this, this is this last step, right? Here, I should, I should say here. So this is occurring in the cortex and it's stealing it from FDCs, okay? And then it gets a signal to go to the T cell zone, right? Because you've got all these activation signals. That's the first step. This leads to activation of the B cells. Then the B cells are gonna to go towards the T cell zone and as they're doing that, they've stolen antigen they're degrading it and putting it onto MHC2 in the M2C. And then once they get to the cortical, the cortical paracortical junction, the T cell that's already been activated is going to try and recognize antigen presented on the B cell. So that's why when we put this figure up, it's actually never happens like this. It's never, T cells are not seeing antigen on a B cell in the cortex, they have to recognize and be activated separately. And then they come together where they do this last step. Okay, so 
Antigen recognition occurs via the B cell receptor in CR2. That provides that initial activation signal. The B cell now is going to go towards the T cell zone and it's internalizing the antigen and processing it. And it, as it goes towards the T cell zone, eventually it's going to run into T cells and it's presenting the antigen on its surface. Now this is a step where the T cells provide a signal for full B cell activation. Okay, and we'll go through what that is in just a second. Or right now, actually. So the key signal that a B cell is getting here is this protein called CD40. So T cells are expressing CD40 ligand and B cells are expressing CD40. Okay, so the T cells got activated totally separately by dendritic cells in the T cell paracortical region. Those T cells that got activated now are told, okay, go find your B cell. So they head towards the B cell zone. The B cells that got activated in the cortex by recognizing antigen and IC3B upregulate CD40. Okay, so they're going together and they both have their respective uh, proteins that need to meet up. And this turns out to be the, the key signal for B cells. If you don't have CD40, you have a pretty serious disease and we'll talk about the end of the lecture. So for full B cell activation, you need CD40 signaling on the B cell and that's from CD40 ligand on the T cell. Okay, so that's B cell signaling. And so this tells the B cell Okay, all systems go, you, you made an initial activation, it was confirmed by complement. Now you have this linked recognition of T cells that they also got activated that says, yes, you absolutely should make a response. So these B cells form germinal centers. Um, and, sorry, scratch out this part here. This isn't a function of CD40 signaling. Well, we'll come back to the primary foci. But full B cell activation gives uh, B, cell, B cells will proliferate for, in the germinal centers, and then all the other things go along with that. Uh, somatic hypermutation, affinity maturation, isotype switching, differentiation into memory cells and plasma cells. So we'll, we'll go through that in just a second. But it also works the other way, right? The T cells, are being told, well, go see if a B cell has something to, to show you. If it does, that confirms for the T cell, yes, become a full, uh, fully fledged effector T cell. And, and the main thing that we're interested in here is what are the CD4 cells doing? They've got to get the signal from CD40 ligand and that tells them to, to fully activate, but then the, they get to produce the cytokines that direct the B cell response. Okay, so that's shown here. If you have, you can think of this as the cortical, paracortical junction. And this is where the T cells are going towards the B cell zone. The B cells are going towards the T cell zone and they're now presenting antigen to the T cell. And the, so the key interaction is here. That tells the T cell, yes, you can release the cytokines to direct the response. In this case, it's a T helper type two response. So it makes cytokines that are going to direct for things like IgE. And those are cytokines that tell the B cell, okay, you should make this kind of antibody response. The B cells then go back into the cortex to the and form germinal centers where they start making antibody producing cells. Sorry, a quick question. Yes. Your slide. Um, so what are these, if the T cells are activated or partially activated and then they become fully activated after this interaction with the B cell, what, what are they in that in-between stage? And they're a, what we would call a T0 uh, type response, an undifferentiated uh, helper cell. So it's, it, it's just like B cells. B cells initially got activated and then to get full activation, they need a T cell T cells initially get activated and then they have to go find a B cell. But we'll see when we cover the T cell response, it's a little bit more involved than that. But there's not really a name for 
uh, for that transition before they get the signal from B cells. Thanks. Okay, so we, in, in many textbooks, they make a strong delineation between T independent and T dependent responses, or thymus independent or thymus independent, thymus dependent or thymus independent responses, or TI versus TD. Now, in reality, that's an artificial distinction. We now know that T independent responses are, are due to, um, you know, short lived antibody responses that just never got a T cell. And this, you most often see this when you have polysaccharide specific B cells. So there's a number of vaccines that are just polysaccharide specific. Um, and so those polysaccharides tend to have multiple repeating and uh, epitopes on them. The polysaccharide is the antigen, but it's a repeating element. And so you can activate B cells, whether or not there's complement receptor uh, stuck to it. But you can imagine if there's, if it's just a polysaccharide, there's no, there's no protein, okay? And so there's nothing to present to a T cell. And so if there's nothing for a T cell, then you don't get these CD40, CD40 ligand interactions. And instead what you get are called the primary foci. Okay, and we'll talk about those in a minute, but that's sort of the abortive B cell response. It says, okay, you didn't make a, a you, you didn't uh, present anything to a T cell, but you still got activated, so we're still gonna make a, an antibody response. It's mainly limited to IgM. There's very little um, somatic hypermutation or affinity. There's no, there's no somatic hypermutation. There's no affinity maturation. It's just sort of making, okay, well, we made a response, so let's, let's hedge our bets and we'll make a more IgM and in case there, there really is something there. Dr. These, Blatton? Yes. So primary foci refers to only the B cell response? Correct. Okay. Thank you. And we'll cover it again in just a second, because I think um, I have some self-drawn figures that sort of make it easier to, to understand. But here's our T independent response. Okay, we have a, a polysaccharide. It's got multiple repeating epitopes on it. That cross-links the B cell receptor. It goes towards the T cell zone and it's looking for, for T cells, but it doesn't have any, any protein to digest and present. So therefore, it just keeps on flying past the T cells and in the paracortex forms a primary foci. Okay. I'm getting better writing, maybe. That's the primary foci. And it's mostly just IgM. There is some, it can be some isotype switching to Ig2 if there's strong toll-like receptors, but mainly it's just making IgM and saying, well, we didn't have T cell help, so maybe we should just make low affinity IgM. The primary foci are short lived. And so this is why if you have polysaccharide vaccines, you have to keep getting booster shots because you make these primary foci responses, but those eventually disappear and you gotta remake them. So the way that people have overcome this, particularly in vaccine setting, is to provide a protein element, okay? So one commonly used protein element is the tetanus toxoid, in a non-toxic version of that, that's then linked to the polysaccharide. And when you do this, you actually give some protein component so that when this is brought in and internalized, you have something to degrade and present to T cells. And so here's a tetanus toxoid specific T cell coming in and recognizing that protein the epitope that's derived from the protein. And then that will then be able to provide CD40 signals to the B cell, okay? Now, the question is, during any response, do both of these happen? And the answer is yes. If early in a response, a B cell got activated and T cells have not yet been fully activated, okay, you could call this the early part of the response where first you get primary foci, then once the T cells catch up, and then they can provide the help, and then you get germinal center formation. And we'll, we'll cover that again when we talk about the kinetics of the, or the dynamics of the immune response in later lectures, where you're talking about several orchestrated steps, okay? Now, 
if you think about this, this is sort of fooling the immune system into this non-linked recognition because the B cell receptor is seeing one epitope and the T cell receptor is seeing something that the B cell doesn't even know is there. Okay, so this is sort of um, unlinked recognition. What we call this part, the polysaccharide part of this is the haptin. And haptins can be anything, you know, it can be very small, they can be just uh, small molecules that are linked to a protein, which we call the carrier. And this basically is to enable that B cell to have some, some protein element to process and present something to a T cell. And that's how you get longer lived responses. Okay, so let's talk about this in terms of how the, the steps work. Okay, and I flipped the, the lymph node upside down. So here's the cortex down in the bottom right. And so antigens coming in through the afferent lymphatics, it gets put on the follicular dendritic cells. The B cell got activated and went towards the T cell zone. Okay, the T cells either haven't recognized the antigen or there's no protein there. And so the default pathway this an, if this antigen specific B cell does not get uh, CD40 signals from a T cell, then it forms in the paracortex, the primary foci. And it sort of should say, it should say in the paracortical regions, not the medullary regions, depending on how closely do you find those. So please change that in your notes. This should be in the paracortex. Okay, now these are short-lived antibody producing cells and we call those plasma blasts. Whenever we use the term blast in immunology, it means a rapidly dividing proliferating cell. So this is a, you know, the B cells didn't get T cell help, but they go in ahead and start making antibodies. And this is mostly IgM. So the plasma blasts, which form the primary foci, are mostly just making IgM because they didn't get a, a CD40 signal. So what does IgM do? Well, IgM is great at complement fixation, right? And it also forms big complexes that are better transported. So it's really making IgM here to further activate the immune response. So get, if you're making IgM, it's, it can better put complement onto IC3B onto stuff. And then it gets, then you can have better transport to the lymph node. It also, remember the other function of complement is to kill stuff. And so if you activate complement, you're also getting formation of the membrane attack complex and potentially killing anything that's out there. But as I said, these primary foci plasma blasts are short lived. And so long-term immunity to something in terms of antibodies really relies on forming the germinal center. And so that's where a B cell has to get a T cell signal. Okay, so one thing that we should talk about here is how does the B cell choose to make a surface receptor versus a secreted antibody? And we've sort of touched on this before, but um, the B cell receptor mRNA is alternatively spliced. Okay, so there's two different signals. There is a secretion signal and a membrane bound signal or a membrane bound domain. Now, normally, when a B cell is just looking to get activated, you're alternatively splicing to the membrane part of this. And, and notice what is the default here? The default would be the, the secretion signal. But under normal conditions, when your B cell is just looking to get activated, it's got the membrane signal. But now, once it gets activated and it's proliferating, now you're trying to, you've turned on uh, transcription of the B cell receptor at high levels. And so you can't really keep splicing to this part of it. Instead, you default to the secretion signal. Okay, so, so you make it so it's not, no longer membrane bound. You, if you can splice all the time to the membrane pound version, then you get the part that sticks in the membrane. If not, it's just released from the cell. Okay. Now, 
let's say that that happened early in response to get plasma blasts or it happened in T independent response, but really you need the CD4 help. So now here comes our T cells have gotten activated, right? T cells initially came in through the high endothelial venules. They recognize antigen on conventional dendritic cells. That gave them their initial activation. They head towards the B cell zones. The B cell got activated on follicular dendritic cells and it heads towards the T cell zone. Now you have these two antigen specific cells and they meet at the pericortical, the cortical pericortical junction. And this is where that CD40 ligand uh, binds to CD40 on the B cells and activates it. Okay, so the B cell gets this signal. Yeah, the T cells are, are in, all in on this too. So now instead of going and forming primary foci, it heads back to the germinal center. Okay, the germinal center is just the structure of where B cell, full B cell differentiation has occurred. Instead of forming plasma blasts, which are antibody producing dividing cells, you instead form central blasts. Now these are rapidly divided B cells, but they're doing some extra steps before they're gonna make antibodies. And we'll come back to the theme of you mutate the receptor and then you test. And so this is a process called somatic hypermutation, where you're intentionally making errors in the DNA. Once it does that, then you have to test, okay? And so it's a organized structure where you can mutate, then test of the B cells. And this, this is how you get long-lived plasma cells and memory B cells that provide long-term immunity, okay? So if you just get primary foci, that's a short-term immunity or also early in an immune response. But if you get CD4 help, then you get the germinal centers you get better antibodies, isotype switching, and you generate um, plasma cells and memory B cells. Dr. Botman? Yes. So in this figure, plasma blasts aren't being created because there's this T cell, B cell interaction. Right. That's just, okay. So instead of going here, they go and form a germinal center. If we go back to the previous slide, if there's no T cell help, then they don't form, they don't go here. Instead, they go form the primary foci. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. So this is what a germinal center looks like. And you can see these in, in almost any lymph node structure where you have a response ongoing. And they're a specialized compartment. And so it's divided into sort of different parts. And here's our pericortical region. So if we draw a line here, the T cell zone is where the T cell response is happening. And we'll talk about that in subsequent lectures. And the, the per, the, this is the pericortex and this is the cortex. And the cortex you have sort of two areas. You have the germinal center, here, and then the mantle zone, which is everything outside of the germinal center in the cortical region. The germinal center is further divided into two regions, the dark zone and the light zone. And these are compartmentalized. There's the rapid proliferation and mutation is happening in the dark zone. The testing of those mutations happens in the light zone. Okay, then this is sort of how the B cell response gets better over time. Okay, so the dark zone is the rapidly dividing B cells and they're undergoing somatic hypermutation and the light zone is the testing area for those mutations. The light zones are non-dividing B cells. So the dark zone is dark because it's very cell dense because those are the prol proliferating cells. The light zone, those cells stop proliferating and now they're looking for antigen on the surface of follicular dendritic cells that are in the light zone. So the FDC are sitting out here with antigen. And so that's the test. Can you still bind antigen? 
There are also specialized T cells that we'll go into in subsequent lectures that are follicular helper cells. These are specialized T cells that sit in that light zone to present to direct the response and to provide further CD40 signals. So germinal centers are temporary structures. They only really exist while there's antigen, okay? Or you can really think they're, they're mainly just during when there's an infection. And so this is a, a, if you see a germinal center, you're actively making an immune response to something. Okay, so, uh, we'll come back to the names. But there's some terminology here. The dark zone are central blasts. And remember, blast means rapidly dividing. The light zone, the cells actually proliferate here and mutate. When we get to the light zone, they're called central sites. Sites just mean cells. So blast, central blasts are dividing cells. Central sites are the ones being tested. We'll come back to that in a second. So what are they doing in the dark zone? Well, the first thing is they're undergoing somatic hypermutation. Actually, this is incorrect. There's a lot of typos in this lecture that I didn't catch. So it'd be SHM is the process by which B cells will intentionally put mutations into the coding sequence for the B cell receptor. The idea is that maybe it's that initial B cell receptor was not a perfect fit. So we're gonna make it better. And the way that you do that is you mutate the DNA and then you test and then you mutate it and test. And so as the response goes on, you get more and more mutations during a B cell response. And you can see where those occur, right? If this is the entire coding sequence for the VDJ of the heavy chain or the VJ um, part of the light chain, you can see that they have CDR1, 2, and 3. Where do most of the mutations occur? They actually occur in the CDR1, right? In the CDR2 and the CDR3. Okay, and that's because those are the part of the anti antibody that are binding to antigen. And this happens for both the heavy chain and the light chain. And this is all directed by a, pro, uh, by a enzyme called activation induced deaminase. And all that that does is changes, um, changes T's to U's, okay? Or sorry, it changes C's to use. I should be correct. Well, that's on the next slide. But this activation-induced deaminase is, a, is upregulated because of CD40 signals. There's no CD40, you don't get AID, and therefore you don't get somatic hypermutation. So what does it do? Well, you're actively transcribing this RNA for the B cell receptor. And so this is openly active transcribed uh, DNA. And so AID is gonna recognize that and come in and start um, playing around. It's gonna start converting Cs to U. It's not entirely clear if this is targeted to those, um, to the B cell receptors specifically, but it's making mutations in the B cell receptor. Now here it says it's not entirely clear if the HVR or the, the CDR1, 2, and 3 are targeted specifically more than other parts of the B cell receptor. Some evidence says that, yeah, there's some direction that it's specifically trying to make mutations there. I think most people would say, well, no, it's making mutations all over. But if it's, if it's going to affect antigen binding, it's got to be in the CDR1, 2, and 3. If it's somewhere else, it's not going to affect recognition. And in fact, if it's in the framework regions, it can cause that antibody to fall apart and so those B cells die, okay? So it's sort of AID is coming in and making mutations. But yes, it's- um, I had a quick question. Yeah. Because this doesn't seem as risky as uh, somatic recombination. Uh, do we see less B cell cancers arise from this hypermutation process versus somatic recombination? You do, actually. Um, so just like in somatic recombination, what you're doing is you're damaging the, the DNA and then you're repairing it, right? And so 
all AID is doing is making a, it's, it's actually just taking the amine group off of cysteine, which makes it into a uracil. And then your cell doesn't like to have uracil in your DNA, so it's fixing that. We'll talk about isotype switching, which is again, damaging DNA and then trying to repair it. And that's a more risky business. Somatic hypermutation is just making point mutants, single nucleotide substitution. It doesn't chop the DNA in big pieces. It doesn't um, make it longer or shorter. You're just getting point mutations, okay? So that's in the, this slide here, okay? So CD40 signaling on the B cell, right, where it meets up with the T cell, gives you expression of AID, activation-induced deaminase. And all it's doing, is it takes cysteine residues, or not cysteine, cytidine residues, and makes those into uracil. Okay, so it's just deaminating uh, cytidine. Now, that's something that your cell doesn't like, okay, and it has to repair that. And there's, a, there's a couple ways that it does this. The first is that those cells can then, uh, are rapidly proliferating, so they just ignore it and go on. In the process, Right, this is actually going to form, you're going to get the original version that has a G and that then, and the new strand, here's the new strand, is going to be, when that DNA replicates, it'll be paired with the C. So you have the original version, but in this strand, as it replicates, it's actually just gonna replace the U with a T. And so you get, you get two different copies right, in the DNA. You get the original version here and the new version here. Shouldn't use two different ends. Now, why is this important? Okay, so that cell divides. One cell, one daughter cell gets the original sequence and one daughter cell gets the new sequence. Okay, and we're in 2A here, we're only showing the daughter cell that got the new sequence. Why is that? Any ideas? Is it that the new sequence is what's going to, you know, have that mutation, which might increase the uh, binding of the receptor, or? Um, it could. This mutation could increase binding, but it could also decrease binding. The reason that one daughter cell gets the original sequence and one daughter cell gets this new sequence is so that you never move backwards. So if this doesn't work, well, you still got, you know, let's say that this mutation results in worse binding, then it, you don't want to go that way, but you still retain the original sequence, okay? So in all of these, you always get the original sequence plus a new sequence because those cells are dividing. Now, the other way that happened that, that it gets repaired is that there is these proteins, MSH2 and 6, that come in and they just convert this U back to a, a C. So you get GC at that site. But then what it'll do is it'll start making mutations in A's and T's that are outside of that site. So you're making sort of second site mutations. And then as those get, as the DNA is replicated there, then you get that version. Okay, so again, you would get one daughter cell, as the cells are dividing, is going to get the original sequence, and one daughter cell is going to get the sequence where it's mutated in a, a, a or T at another site, and so it's going to get that sequence. Okay. Now, the classical way that this is done, or the, the way that's been studied the most, is actually um, you have a protein called uracil N glycosylase. It basically just cuts out the base part of the DNA. Right? The DNA has the sugar backbone and then it has the base for pairing. Well, it leaves the sugar backbone, but it just cleaves out the base part of it. Okay, so it's called an abasic site. You then have a protein called Rev1 that comes in and just says, I'm gonna put whatever base I want there. So it can put up to four different versions. Okay, 
Now, as that replicates then, one daughter cell gets the original sequence and one daughter cell will get whatever it did, Rev decided to put there. If it decided to put the C there, well, then you get two daughter cells with the same sequence. But it could have easily just as well put a G or an A or a T there. And so the daughter cell would get that new version of the sequence. Okay, so it's, it's always stepping forward. One daughter will get the original and one will get the new mutated sequence. Okay, any questions on that? I'm just wondering about um, the phrasing. It says mismatch can be repaired in three ways. Right. Is, is that just referring to the three, like, can you explain what that means? So there's this way, it just replicates. Mm -hmm. Where it's in during replication, it just fixes the U to a T. Mm -hmm. And I don't expect you to know all of the steps in that. It can fix it by just putting the U back to a C, but also making a T mutations. Or it can just cut that base out and replace it with whatever it wants. So those are the three, three ways that it's repairing that mismatch. So the mismatch is from the mutations that occur in the hypervariable region. And this then is, this, this is the repair. mismatch here, the GU mismatch. Okay. That it's just that specific, you know, U's don't bind to G's. And so that makes the DNA sort of out of, uh, makes it not, uh, makes it bulge at that site. And that's what's being recognized. Okay, so we've gone a few minutes over and this is where we're gonna pick up on next time. is sort of what happens after this. This is the mutation part. And the next step is the test part. Or how do we know, how does the B cell then know if it's binding antigen better, okay? So we'll stop here and I'll take any questions. Dr. Blattman, so for all three of the repairs, they, you always end up with an old and a new sequence. Correct. So then for the replication, it's still replicating both the GC and then making a new AT pair. Right, this strand, right, it's got a G there. Mm -hmm. So it, as it replicates that strand, it fills it in and that, that G gets paired with a C. This strand. Oh, then that gets paired with them. Gets fixed to a T and then as it's being replicated, the new strand forms an A. So you can sort of just separate the strands and say, well, this G strand goes up here. This U strand gets repaired to a T and that gets paired with a A when it's replicated. So you can sort of see the same thing here, right? This strand, when it gets replicated, that strand gets paired with a C. And then decide it, depending on what Rev1 puts there, it, the new strand can be any of these. Right, because this A basic site gets put here. So depending on what, what Rev1 puts there, the new strand just follows that. I have a question again about, I'm just sorry, I'm a little bit caught up on the word, on the, the sentence, the mismatch can be repaired. Is this referring to just any random mutation that occurs and then the AID comes in and repairs it? Or is the AID inducing the mismatch? And he's making the mismatch. So AID, We'll take the amine group of a cytidine mm -hmm. and take it off, and that gives you uracil. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's it, it's that's its only job is to make okay. a C into a U, and so AID is creating the mismatch. Uh huh. And then the repair is now okay. So here you have the mismatch. What do you do with it? And that's the three different repairs. Oh, okay, 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 okay. I got it now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Blotman, um, 
looking forward, I don't know if you mentioned it yet, um, but is there any kind of change since the last week of finals isn't happening anymore? Yes, um, sorry, I forgot to bring that up. So we were informed that there's no finals week now. And so the final will be on the last day of class, which was designed to be a review session, but instead Evelyn will be holding the review session outside of that time. But um, yeah, so the final is on the last day of the class. I think that actually is on uh, Canvas, yeah, it's updated. It should be on, on Canvas, on the syllabus. We've updated oh, okay. that. Um, yeah, it's, it's on December, uh, 3rd. December 3rd, the normal class time, 9 to 10.15. OK, thank you so much. So there was a question of whether epitopes have to be proteins. And for B cells, the answer is no. B cells can make antibodies to virtually anything, small molecules. Um, but if there's no protein thing, then there's nothing to present to a T cell. So the question is the medullary region. Yes, it was replaced with the paracortex. Maybe this is a silly question, but is the IC3B processed and presented on MHC2? How it is, is that we, controlled for? Well, think about what you're asking. What kinds of proteins are, are T cells selected against? Don't overthink it. It's, it's actually an easy answer. Would you expect to have IC3B specific T cells? No, definitely not. Because right, so it's, it's been selected. You've, out, you've selected but, against them, and in yeah. fact, the complement proteins are so ubiquitous they get they're everywhere. And so, even if there was a IC3B specific T cell that escapes thymus, it's going to encounter um, some. It's going to encounter the IC3B epitope and get sort of energized in the periphery, anyways. So no, the you don't have T cells recognizing IC3B because you deleted them. Okay, I was just making it. Yeah, I just wanted. I was curious if there was some mechanism where it kept it. There was it blocked IC3B from being processed, but I guess. It's no, it it gets degraded just like anything else. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, if there's no other questions, for those of you in the honors grad section, there's no recitation tomorrow. You get a week off and then we'll restart next week. For everybody else, we'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs>